Hello to you and a very warm welcome to Monday's programme. DDS and thanks for joining us. First tonight, 13 people have been arrested after police moved in to evict anti-motorway protesters from cottages near Darwin in Lancashire. The terrace properties stand in the way of work to extend the M65 and they'll now be demolished. Mark Owen has been following today's events. The irresistible force meeting the almost immovable object. Around 100 police converged on Darwin to move the latest protest against the M65 motorway extension. In the van are protesters just removed from the houses into which they'd barricaded and even concreted themselves. The protest centres on these terrace cottages which stand in the way of the motorway extension. The first protester was removed from the rooftop at around 10 this morning. Once back down to earth on Blackburn Road, he was critical of local people for not acting to save their countryside. The people that are standing out on their risk in their lives are doing this to save this bit of land becoming a motorway junction. And these people over the road, I'm not sure how they feel, but they've not been giving any active support. The public needs to be aware of what's going on, needs to act on it. Now. If they'd have done this, say, 1983, 1985, when the motorway was first proposed, there wouldn't have been none of this. If they'd have objected to it then, I would have supported them. It began before Christmas when protesters moved into the cottages behind me, which are to be bulldozed to make way for the M65 extension. Since 8 o'clock this morning, police and bailiffs have been trying to get them out. The protesters accept that they can't win, but they say as soon as this protest ends, another one will begin. There's another two camps that have established further along that way, as it were, towards Tockles and Stanworth Woods, which is the tree village that we've heard so much about in the press and the such like. And there's always somewhere we can go and there's always some trouble we can cause. Trouble in the name of the environment. The protesters say the road will kill trees and fields and cause pollution. The local people say their roads are already too congested and many agree with the extension, which will link East Lancashire with the M6 and M61. Everyone's got a right to peaceful protest and everyone has their different views about the merits or, or not of, of road construction. Yes, I can understand that. What I can't understand is the methods they've used today. Um, you can see that they are um, putting not only their own lives at risk by their activities, but those of the, the sheriff and his men. The under-sheriff of Lancashire removed the last two protesters from a bunker beneath a cellar of one house at four o'clock this afternoon. They'd set themselves into concrete, poured into oil drums. The houses will be demolished tomorrow, all in Allen's safe. There are no reported casualties from this eviction. Both sides are now preparing for the next one. A second inquest has opened in Liverpool into the death of Mike Card, the former MP for Bootle, more than four and a half years after he died. The original inquest was dramatically stopped 13 months ago, and earlier this year the Director of Public Prosecutions ruled that no one should be prosecuted over Mr Carr's death. Tim Wyatt reports from the inquest. Mike Carr had celebrated becoming the Labour MP for Bootle only eight weeks before he died suddenly on the 20th of July 1990. The coroner, Christopher Johnson, told the jury the original inquest had been abandoned after a judicial review and a fresh hearing ordered. Today's inquest heard how Mr Carr was taken ill during a packed Labour Party meeting at the Black Horse pub in Walton. Trade union official Jimmy Symes, who was there, said he'd found Mr Carr sitting on the pavement outside the pub. His face looked grey, he was in a cold sweat, and he told Mr Symes he had chest pains and his hands felt numb. An ambulance took Mr. Carr to Walton Hospital, but after being examined by a doctor there, he was told he could go home. Mr. Symes told the inquest that he'd been surprised at the hospital's decision to discharge Mr. Carr. He said that he'd had to help him to get dressed, and that he'd been so weak he'd needed a wheelchair to get to the door. He said it had been very difficult to get Mr. Carr in and out of the taxi, which took him home. Mr. Symes said he then went to his own house, and when he got back to Mr. Carr's house a few minutes later, he was lying on the settee. It was then that he realised that he was dead. Mr. Carr's widow, Linda, who'd been with him on the Friday evening when he died, said she too had seen her husband slumped outside the pub. Mrs. Carr said hospital staff had told her her husband was hyperventilating, that he'd suffered an anxiety attack, and that he was panicking. She was told to call the family doctor if the pain got any worse. She too spoke of his difficulties getting dressed and getting in and out of the taxi home. She told the inquest she'd stumbled through the front door with him and thrown him on the settee. A paramedic who arrived at the car's house described his attempts to resuscitate the MP with electric shocks to his chest, but he was unable to revive him. 
The inquest continues tomorrow. Now, have any of you ever heard of the Commissioner for the Rights of Trade Union Members or the Commissioner for Protection Against Unlawful Industrial Action? Well, if you haven't, then you're not on your own. They're both quangos based in Warrington. Their organisation set up and funded by the government to investigate complaints against unions and their annual budget is more than £400,000. A far cry from the annual budget of the Citizens Advice Bureau over the road. Our political correspondent, Alison Tarpey, has this report. The two quangos were set up five years ago by the Department of Employment, anxious that employees should have somewhere to take their grievances if their trade union had acted unfairly or illegally towards them. The Commission offers financial assistance to trade union members if they have a complaint. But some are now questioning the necessity of these quangos and particularly the amount of taxpayers' money they receive. According to the annual reports, the Commissioner, Jill Rowlands, earns £50,000 a year. Her total budget for the year 93 to 94 was £422,000. And in that time, her staff of six have dealt with 47 applications, one of which went to court. And they received 642 calls inquiring about the Commissioner's role. So can they justify this? I think it can be justified. One because it isn't an enormous budget to run two offices nationally and I think it can be justified to protect the rights of trade union members. But across the road from the Commissioner's office is the Citizens Advice Bureau where there's a very different picture. The manager Debbie O'Brien earns £16,000. Our core funding is around £70,500 a year. Out of that we have to pay £20,000 in rent. The rest of the money then has to cover two full-time management salaries, a part-time clerical worker and a part-time welfare rights worker. We deal with around 12,000 enquiries a year. Last week, Wigan MP Ian McCartney tabled 45 questions to the Secretary of State for Employment demanding to know why the Quangos receive so much funding compared to organisations like the Citizens Advice Bureau. This is costing every time you telephone the Commission £399 a telephone call and nearly £63,000 per case for legal costs and nothing to show for it, while the tribunal system is having money taken away from it. Completely scandalous situation. Michael Portillo has still not replied to any of Mr McCartney's questions, but in a statement to Granada Television, he told us that the effectiveness of the commissioners ought not to be judged simply by the number of applications made to them that that was like assessing the effectiveness of a guard dog by the number of people it bites, rather than by its success at deterring burglars. The statement continues that the government has always made it clear that it's happy to see relatively low-level activity in the Commissioner's office, provided that trade unions are not denying their members' rights or acting unlawfully. And still to come in Granada tonight. It's dad versus lad in a rugby league battle with no holes barred. A family ruck with only one winner. And as winter winds continue to chill us to the bone, throw out those combinations and start thinking thermal. Winter draws on indeed. Don't go away. Before that, it's time to join Andrew for other news from the region this evening. Andrew. Thank you, Bob. We start tonight with the banning of a teenager from Oldham Town Centre. A court banned the 14-year-old boy from the town after allegations that he terrorised the elderly and disabled on a council estate. The boy, who can't be named for legal reasons, was arrested last night and charged with assaulting a 72-year-old woman. He's been remanded into the care of social services and he's also had a nighttime curfew imposed. A climber from Manchester is feared dead after falling in atrocious weather on Ben Nevis. Accountant Anthony Marsh, who's 40, is believed to have fallen through a snow overhang while descending Ben Nevis on Saturday. Bad weather forced the search by RAF helicopter and mounted rescue teams to be called off yesterday. The search was resumed this morning, but so far he hasn't been found. Manchester United's Eric Cantona is back home tonight following his much-publicised holiday in the West Indies. He left his home at Boothtown earlier today after returning yesterday from a break in Guadeloupe. Cantona is travelling to London to be questioned by police after allegedly assaulting a fan during United's game at Crystal Palace. He's expected to appear at South Norwood Police Station where teammate Paul Ince was questioned last week in connection with the same incident. Cantona is also due to face a Football Association Disciplinary Committee on Friday. 
A teenager is being questioned by customs officers at Manchester Airport following the seizure of two kilos of heroin worth £200,000. The 17-year-old youth was arrested after arriving from Pakistan. The teenager, who comes from Buckinghamshire, is expected to appear before Manchester magistrates uh, later today. Now, Lake District hoteliers are being asked to help save the red squirrel. South Lakeland is one of the last parts of Britain where the red squirrel still thrives. It's usually forced out of its habitat when its hardier grey cousin invades the area. Wildlife officers are concerned at increased sightings of the grey squirrel in South Lakeland. They want hoteliers to report any they see and to install special feeders that only the reds can use. Well, now it's back to Hazel with details of the weekend's... Uh, Bob, I beg your pardon, uh, weekend soccer action. Here's Bob. Just love those squirrels. I've got all the grey ones in the world in my back garden and they eat all my little flowers. 3-1 win over Leeds and that was without that Mr Cantona we saw there. But who needs Eric when Sparky Hughes is in such sparkling form? Here's Rob Palmer with a roundup of the weekend's football action and in particular the fifth round of the FA Cup. It was an emotional Mark Hughes as Manchester United gave the knockout blow to Leeds in quicker time than Frank Bruno. Less than a minute gone when Steve Bruce sent Leeds reeling. Barely a boxing round later, the same old one-two, this time Brian McClure with a lethal blow. And Mark Hughes made it a rocky style finish with a goal, just weeks after he thought his days as a Manchester United heavyweight were well over. Andy Dibble may be wondering how many days he has left as Manchester City's first choice goalkeeper. It was doziness from Dibble which gifted Keith Gillespie the first goal. His opposite number, Pavel Cernicek, showed equal eccentricity when he dropped a corner right at the feet of Uwe Rosler. One time Manchester City reject, John Beresford won revenge with a fluke goal, which again didn't cover goalkeeper Dibble in glory. And another former Manchester junior, Keith Gillespie, reluctantly released by United, scored his second goal to send the Toon Army to Everton in the quarter-finals. Liverpool are still uncertain of a quarter-final place because of their habitual jitters against Wimbledon. A classy Andy Clark goal shook Anfield. But Robbie Fowler's second vital goal of the week, his first in the FA Cup, gave Liverpool a second chance at Selhurst Park. Everton didn't need any second chances. They took five against Norwich. And as Limpar was simply stunning. He added a new dimension to the up and Adam approach, which was still evident in Joe Parkinson's goal. It was quite a display from Everton against a team who are seven places above them in the Premiership. Paul Rideout and Duncan Ferguson simply tore the Norwich defence to pieces. It was the most relaxed and reassuring Saturday afternoon at Goodison Park, in stark contrast to the relegation slot. The prelude to the tie of the quarters against Newcastle on Sunday, March the 12th. Holders Manchester United's home game with Queen's Park Rangers will be on the Monday. Liverpool don't care when they play, they just want to win the replay. There's now just 48 hours to Bolton's Big Cup night. They warmed up for Wednesday's Coca-Cola semi, second leg, with an exciting league win against Barnsley. After Alan Thompson gave them the lead, Richard Snaker's sizzler made sure they kept top spot. They're one point and one place above Tranmere, who knocked Reading down a peg or two at Prenton Park. Goal scorer Ian Muir is going to make it hard for John Aldridge to get his place back. In Division 2, Carlisle had the longest unbeaten run in Britain until they got into deep trouble at Deepdale. Mike Conroy lifted Preston North End into the top six. In Rugby League, Wigan are still runaway leaders of the Stones Bitter Championship, but for a change they had a scare. Wakefield Trinity were winning until Martin of Fire chose a timely moment to run in his 200th league try. Jonathan Davis went back to his rugby union roots to assist in preserving Warrington's unbeaten home record. When his bomb landed, Andy Bennett, he of the clean kit, picked up the shrapnel to score a try. Oldham's winning run came to an end against St Helens. The Saints back on form, a highlight try, Alan Hunt's 19th of the season. Grass seed salesmen will be queuing up at Norton Park, but witness its mud, glorious mud. Steve McCurry, here of the Gazza build, showed Gazza foot skills, dribbling for Carl Hammond to lay an important hand on the ball. Now then, like father, like son, they say, and most dads are delighted if their son decides to follow them into their chosen profession. But when father meets son in a rugby league match, well, it seems there's simply no room for family loyalties. And a guild touched down at the home of the Rochdale Hornets to witness a modern-day War of the Roses. 
At Spotland, the Gratian family played the generation game with Dad Jeff, the ex-Great Britain skipper and Batley player coach, against son Paul, who plays for Rochdale Hornets. Uh, I played against him once at, uh, when he played for Bradford, I played for Featherston, and I come out on top that day, and I just hope it's going to be the same today.